हेलो एवरीवन वेलकम टू द आईएनआईसीटी रैपिड रीकैप सीरीज फॉर ईएनटी आई एम डॉक्टर सरवजीत सिंह योर वेरी ओन ईएनटी फैकल्टी एंड आई एम गोइंग टू डिस्कस क्वेश्चंस फॉर अ रैपिड रिकॉल और रैपिड रीकैप ऑफ ऑल द टॉपिक्स व्हिच आर फ्रीक्वेंटली आस इन द आईएनआईसीटी एग्जाम नाउ बिफोर वी गो टू दिस रैपिड रीकैप सेशन यू नो आईएनआईसीटी the premier more institutes of india and if you get in any of them you are going to be one lucky chap because that label will remain throughout your lifetime but as you know uh, like many students think that this exam is going to be a very very tough exam it's not like that the exam is very easy the exam is very conceptual and generally the questions which are asked are asked from the basics yes a few questions are asked which are tough which are advanced but i have seen that generally they don't make any difference in your selection yes they make a difference in your rejection because if you get anxious if you get worried then you are likely to make many more questions wrong right so it is important just like a you know the world cup is going on and just like a T20 game or a 50-50 game, you have to just look for the bad balls and you have to pick them up and you have to hit them for boundaries. So same way over here, you have to look for easy questions and you have to hit them correct. If you are able to mark all the easy questions nicely, okay, all the conceptual and basic questions nicely, nobody can stop you from making a selection and a good rank. in this inict exam as well okay so without wasting any more time i'm just starting uh, with the previous year questions we'll start we'll start from the recent most paper and we'll go backwards if i am audible if i am uh, visible to all of you if uh, every, the screen is visible please give us a thumbs up let me start with the first question over here now arrange the sequence of auditory pathway from peripheral to central this question i have seen is a favorite question of the aims body or the inict body and it has been asked multiple times in the exam as you can see in the november in the may 2023 this was asked it was asked earlier in the june 2022 and when the aims used to conduct a separate exam in may 2019 also it was asked so this is a very important question and we know that the sequence of this is e coli ma In fact, you know, in the 2023 May exam, the same question was repeated twice, right? So you can just say into two. If you know the right answer, it is into two. Twice the same question was there, right? And the mnemonic for this is E coli ma. What is E? E stands for eighth nerve, right? Coli stands for cochlear nucleus. Now remember. cochlear nucleus is spiral in structure so it is also known as spiral ganglion right o for olivary complex superior olivary complex now remember superior olivary complex is in trapezoid body so sometimes this is also given in the exam right and this is the place where the sound goes to the contralateral side so you know these were ipsilateral and now the sound goes to contralateral side so the crossover of sound takes place over here at superior olivary complex right and then we have l l is for lateral lemniscus right and we have i i is for inferior colliculus right so remember i always say my mnemonic as e coli ma okay so why do i say it as e coli ma because you see over here e this e over here sorry so this e over here this is the nerve right so e remember e is the nerve right the coli this is the brain stem and ma over here ma is the cortex 
right ok. So, you see over here. So, this coli this is your brain stem and then ma me m is medial geniculate body and a is auditory cortex Broadman's area 41 right. So, this you have to remember and whenever you get this question yes Dr. Mithu you are absolutely correct what we have to simply do is this is the simplest way is that you write E coli ma and start placing each one of them below it ok. So, you see over here below the uh, below the inferior colliculi before below I I put A cochlear nucleus I put B over here auditory cortex I put C over here media nucleate body I put over here. So, B A D C that is the answer. Hello Poonam, hello Mithu ok. So, you know that is how you have to mark this question. Very easy has been asked four times in the exam ok twice in May and June and May 2019 as well right ok. Let us go to the next question. Now, this question was a typical question this was a little tricky question why because we generally do not teach this topic to undergraduate students right. However, this question was still solvable you just have to understand the basics if you understand the basics. So, that is what goes for all those questions as well which you know you do not know you have not read it and for this you know uh, there is a trick there is a trick that I like to share this trick after this question I will share this trick with you let us many more students also join and I will share the trick with you. Let us go to the question first a 15 year 15 year old girl ok a 15 year old girl is presented to the OPD. She complains that she can hear voices but has difficulty understanding words. Now, this is very important line right. She can hear voices, but she has difficulty in understanding words. Her peyoton audiometry and Bera were inconsistent with each other. The PTA being more or less normal. So, the examiner is saying that the hearing of this patient is more or less normal because the peyoton audiometry is normal. But on the other side, the patient, the examiner is also saying that the Bera is not consistent with pyotonautimetry. So, if we, if the pyotonautimetry is normal, the examiner is saying that the Bera is not normal, the Bera is abnormal because it is inconsistent with, with pyotonautimetry, ok. And it is also saying that her middle latency and cortical responses were absent, right middle latency and cortical responses they were absent. So, Bera is absent. So, Bera is the brainstem evoked responses and if we go little up in the cortex. So, middle latency that is also absent and the cortical responses the artery cortex that is also absent. So, what is the most likely diagnosis of the above condition all right. So, is the patient malingering? Let me go by one by one. Okay, the first option: cochlear autosclerosis. What happens in aut uh, cochlear autosclerosis? I'm going to rule out each and every option before I explain what this question was all about, right? So, cochlear autosclerosis. Is it cochlear autosclerosis? What happens in autosclerosis? There is a conductive hearing loss. Okay, this is a conductive hearing loss. There is a heart's notch dip at 2,000 hertz. Both of them are seen in pyotonodimetry. What about pyotonodimetry over here? Pyotonodimetry is normal. So, this is ruled out, right. Malingering. So, in malingering even if the patient is hearing, the patient will say I am not hearing, ok. But the patient says that she is able to hear voice, but not able to understand the words. And she is also cooperating with you in pyotonodimetry. However, Bera which is a, you know, which is a uh, test that is not objective test not dependent on patient responses that is showing problems ok. Whereas, the subjective test the pyotonodimetry is not showing problem. So, this malingering should not also be a problem. Now, Michel's aplasia is total deafness there is no development of cochlea right. So, there will be no hearing right. So, that will also not that also does not solve this question 
Yes, Neha, you are right over here. The question, the answer has to be a trainerophathy. Okay, so even if you know we have not taught this thing to you, a trainerophathy, still you have able to arrive at this because we have taught you the remaining three, and that is the beauty of MCQs. Sometimes you can reach to an option, the correct option, even without knowing anything about that option. If you have, if you know that about the remaining three options which have been taught to you in your syllabus, so that's the beauty of multiple choice questions, right? Now, what is auditory neuropathy? So, auditory neuropathy is a kind of a auditory dyssynchrony, right? So, you know, we also call it auditory dys synchrony or a dyssynchrony syndrome, right? Where you know there is the cochlea is working it is giving sound it's kind of a neural deafness but the patient is not able to understand the words right so this is a kind of auditory neuropathy now very typical of this patient will be when a child is born if you do oae auto acoustic emissions so generally that's the screening test that we do that comes under the universal screening program right so when you do op autoacoustic emissions that will be normal because OE where do they come from they come from cochlea so till cochlea everything is normal but the beta the beta is abnormal right so this question can come in the exam what I am trying to tell you once they have opened this Pandora box and you know when the INI CT people the AIMS examination cell they make this paper. So, when they have opened the Pandora box of auditory neuropathy, now the next time they can give you this question again, but they can twist you, they can give you about OE and Bera. And remember, in this OE will be normal, right? Because OE is coming from cochlea, whereas Bera, which is checking the neural deafness, that will be abnormal, right? Okay, so that is the most likely diagnosis among these options. It is going to be auditory neuropathy right okay choose the procedure done in the following given image so now this question is also uh, a question which was repeated it was given earlier in july 2021 then it was repeated in may 2023 and the four options were given to you sphenopeltine block anterior ethmoidal block nasociliary block and pel greater peltine block so uh, what i'll do is i'll discuss all the facial blocks with you now, these facial blocks, they are a gray area between the ophthalmology people and ENT people. Some of these blocks, they are used by ophthalmology people for oculoplastic surgeries. And some of these blocks are used by ENT people for rhinoplasty and other facial plastic surgeries. Okay. However, we usually do not teach, you know, neither the ophthalmology nor the ENT surgeons teach it to the students thinking that the other guy will definitely teach them. And no one ends up teaching them to you in your in your curriculum okay so let us discuss these they are very important they have been asked twice and we use them practically in many cases in our surgeries so let's look over here now to understand these facial blocks it is very important for us to go through the anatomy of the fifth nerve the trigeminal nerve so we know the trigeminal nerve there is a ganglion the trigeminal ganglion also known as gesserian ganglion and this lies in the Meckel's cave now, from this ganglion, we have three branches of trigeminal nerve, V1, V2, and V3. Okay, V1 is the ophthalmic nerve. Now, most of these blocks, they are concerning the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve, that is the V1. So, you can see that this V1 in this diagram, it is going in the orbit, right? Okay, so as it is going in the orbit, you can see over here that it is dividing into frontal nerve, it is dividing into lacrimal nerve and nasociliary nerve. So, three branches it is further dividing as soon as it enters into the, the orbit. Okay? Now, the frontal nerve you can see it goes out and it forms supraorbital nerve and supratochlear nerve. Right? Okay? The, the lacrimal nerve it goes and supplies the lacrimal gland. And the nasociliary nerve, you can see over here, it forms the posterior ethmoidal nerve. It forms the anterior ethmoidal nerve, which comes out anteriorly also and infratrochlear nerve. 
right now the v2 another block that you must remember is the v2 which is forming over here this infra orbital nerve so it also comes down now we know it comes out to the foramen rotundum but it also forms a infra orbital nerve which comes out over here from this foramen infra orbital foramen right so if you know these branches of the trigeminal nerve especially the ophthalmic branch then you can solve all this question let's look at this so you can see at the periphery okay upper periphery lateral part what do we have we have the lacrimal nerve block this is the place where we have the lacrimal gland okay remember remember lacrimal nerve okay then you can see the supra orbital nerve so in the middle over here supra orbital as you go medially over here you have supra trochlear both were branches of frontal nerve okay so supra orbital and supra trochlear both are branches of frontal nerve then you can see over here this is the infra trochlear nerve or better known as naso ciliary nerve what you can do is you have to just remember that this block is given above the medial canthus okay and you can just go parallel over here and you can go deep inside as well approximately 1.5 cm deep and you can give a naso ciliary block okay so this block is actually known as naso ciliary block most questions will mention it as naso ciliary instead of infra trochlear block okay right so that's the naso ciliary nerve which is giving the infra trochlear nerve okay and then you can see over here this is the anterior ethmoidal nerve block we use it many a times over here right okay so this is a infra anterior ethmoidal nerve block in fact this is the place when some uh, something like a septum or a septal spur is impinging upon the middle terminate so there is a referred pain over here okay that is known as sludgers neuralgia okay or anterior ethmoidal nerve neuralgia so this is a place where the anterior ethmoidal nerve pain is experienced over here okay if there is a and we also call it as a contact headache because the spur is impinging on the middle turbinate and from there the pain is coming over here all right so that is known as sludgers neuralgia now this is the infra orbital nerve block this is a v2 nerve block remember this is the v2 block the maxillary nerve block right and we can give this infra orbital nerve block sub label also right and finally there is a zygomatico facial nerve block that we give in the lower periphery over here right so these are the different facial blocks that are given for facial plastic surgeries some of them we try to do under local anesthesia right or uh, given by us or given by the oculoplastic surgeons right let's go to the next question over here another interesting question is south indian female right so let's do one thing let's break down the question okay uh, friends so i would like to break down the question but before i break down the question i was saying a trick that i would like to share over here you know you have 200 questions in your ini ct exam and the same thing will also apply for your neat pg exam okay and even if you are preparing for fmg it may have 300 questions but you can apply the same trick there as well you know most of you can clear this exams you just have to apply some basic tricks into it all right and the basic trick is rounds most of us try to do these 200 question in 3 hours or 3 and a half hours that we get in we get 3 hours in INICT we get 3 and a half hours in NEET PG but you know what happens is the last 20-25 questions are rushed instead you have to solve your paper in different rounds now the round 1 round 1 must consist of easy questions so you have to pick up the questions which are easy which are short they may be having clinical history okay they are repeat questions the questions that you are very confident of that you have done okay that you feel are easy right that you don't have to think so you you already know the question you have already done it multiple times so these are the questions that you have to pick right and you have to do them 
even if that is 120 out of 200. So, leave. What we have to leave? We have to leave all the long questions. You have to leave all the questions with lot of investigations. Okay? You have to leave all the questions that require lot of calculations. Okay? Lot of analytics. So, leave all these questions for round 2. So, if we, even if you are able to do 120 questions out of 200, you have won the battle because out of 120, generally 115, 116 questions are correct. Okay. So, you just have to do one thing. Look at these questions. All right. These are easy. These are short. You have done them multiple times in the classes, from the app, from the books, from the test. Okay. From your notes, you have done them. You are confident. Now, the trick is don't go overconfident. How will you not go over confident? How will you ensure that? Read all four choices, okay, all four options and make sure that one option is correct, okay, and the remaining are incorrect. So, so you have to check the all the options because you have to ensure that you are not overconfident. If you do that, 120 marks are in your kitty. If you have done 120, that means you have cleared the exam. Okay. Now, the remaining questions out of these remaining, you know, 80 questions that are left, long questions, you will get time. You will get a lot of time because you have done the round 1. Easy questions, quickly you have done that. So, go for the round 2, which are long, require analytics. So, you have extra time over there. Right. So, you go for those round 2. And in round 2, you may be able to do 60, you may be able to do 50 or 40. Whatever you are able to do, that's your gain. Round 3. Round 3 is the round where, where you have to, where you have to apply some extra brain. Okay. And I call it as a rule out round because now you don't know the exact question. Question may be out of course. Question may be out of topic. Question may be little tough, difficult. So, you have to apply your analytical brain. You have to rule out the options. You may have may be able to rule out one option, two option or three options and you are able to read the answer. Okay. The more the merrier. So, this is the round three and there is a fourth round that you know INICT has I think one third negative marking, but for NEET PG and FMG, FMG especially there is no negative marking. So, all the remaining options round four in FMG, you can mark B or C. In NEET PG, also it is one fourth negative marking, so you can mark B or C, right? INICT, there is no negative, there is one third negative marking, so there is no point in marking B or C, right? Okay, so uh, this is the most important tip. If you do it like rounds, round one, round two, round three, okay? Okay, so you know you can say that this is the first round, just like the World Cup. This is the first round. This is the semi-finals, and this is the finals, right? I hope you'll get that. Okay, so you 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 do it like that, just like the World Cup, and you will be able to solve and win the trophy for yourself. All right, let's go to this question, uh, Dr. Nishikant. Is your rapid revision sufficient for NEET? Okay, my dear friends. Had this been your FMG question paper, I would have still said yes. Need PG, INICT, and now even FMG, all three are concept based questions. If you have not built concepts, I'm sorry, you will not be able to. And for building the concepts, you have to watch the main videos. If you're preparing for Need PG as per your question, so there's still time. The exam is in May. Oh, sorry, exam is in March as per the current notification. The exam is scheduled to be in March and this is we are right now in October. You have November, you have December, you have at least two months more where you can pick up some more subjects and complete them. And which subjects you have to pick up? Short subjects, okay, medium subjects, basic subjects, you must complete them. Even if you are able to base some long subjects, I know nobody can complete medicine from Harrison, right? Nobody is able to complete surgery from Love and Bailey. Right? Some of the apps have 200, 300 hours of medicine lectures. So, you can't complete them and you can't revise them. So, no problem. Even if you are able to leave some part of long subject, but do complete the short subjects. Subjects like ENT, ophthalmology, FMT, they are highly scoring subjects. So, don't miss them. 
right okay yes you're giving me the answers i can see that very good students dr k k dr sona okay so uh, south indian female farm worker by occupation right farm worker by occupation with history of contact with cattle presented with frank intermittent epistaxis biopsy was performed of mass as seen in pig and following histopathology finding were seen so what is the most likely causative agent rhinoscleroma rhinosporidiosis angiofibroma rhinophyma yes the answer i'll go with my students the answer is rhino sporidiosis very correct what do we see over here what do we see over here the history is indicative the history is indicative what cattle history of cattle in a contact okay so you know rhino sporidium seaberry rhino sporidium seaberry this infects human beings human beings are accidental host this is found in cattle dung now important thing this was earlier thought to be a fungi but we know now that is a, it is a aquatic protozoa right okay good evening subhash all right so that is the answer and in histopathology we see multiple sporangia sporidium like things but it is thought to be, it was thought to be a fungi because of that but why we know that it's a sporidiosis right okay next question spot diagnosis identify the given image you know such kind of spot diagnosis also come in the inict exam very very easy questions for you so identify it come on guys i'm look i'm waiting for your answer spot diagnosis what is this come on yes so this is a case of ranula okay now ranula remember it arises it is a exophysician cyst and it arises from the sub lingual gland right right yes okay so if it comes to the sub mandibular space it is known as impinging ranula then we have to do an external excision for this kind of ranula we can do an internal excision only and we can sometimes even do mar supplization you just have to cut it open it right so that's a mar supplization or we can do an internal excision intraoral excision as well right okay let's go to the next question now this question is a overlapping question integrated question between you know ent and pathology why let's look over here 20 year old male now you see whenever i am solving these questions my habit is to break down the question into different parts right that helps me remember sometimes this history is important sometimes it is not important but sometimes we are able to pick up some tips that make it a one liner helps us solve the question right so 20 year male presents with progressive left sided facial swelling so progressive left sided facial swelling for 2 weeks with a history of traumatic injury now this is important with a history of traumatic injury with wood 2 months back okay so there's a wood injury the cct of the nose and peritoneal sinuses shows a mass in the subcutaneous tissue of the left cheek biopsy examination reveals foreign body granuloma so wood injury and there is a foreign body granuloma so maybe some part of wood has gone inside okay with positive pas and gms scan okay so you know <coughs> the pas stain the pas stain this is used to detect a lot of conditions it detects the carbohydrates and it also shows us the living live fungal tissue live fungal tissue right okay so that is very very important similarly the gms stain it is also used to look at the carbohydrates the glycoproteins and it also you know shows us the presence of fungi so both of these stains collectively over here they show us the 
fungi and you know the pathologist i said it's an integrated question so i would have loved if dr sushant was here but a pathologist will go into the depth and will tell you about these stains the periodic acid shift stain and the gms stain okay the gms name is a tongue twister so uh, i'll not say that name right so but they both are used for fungi staining so my answer is phycomycosis right okay that is the answer yes dr kk you are right let's go to the next question over here so that was the inict let's come to the inict november 2022 exam and the marked structure opens into which of the following sinuses very straightforward question cadaveric images they have become a favorite of the anatomy people as well as you know uh, from the aims body they give these kind of anatomy cadaveric images so these cross sections are very very important for you to study and what do we see over here this is the cross section of the nose okay you can see it's a tidal cross section of the nose and the mark structure over here is this sinus over here what is this sinus very easy this is a sphenoid sinus right and the sphenoid sinus we op opens into sphenoethmoidal recess remember if there is a supreme turbinate present this will be known as supreme meatus so instead of sphenoethmoidal recess if i mention supreme meatus that would be also correct okay right let's go to the next question over here that was a easy question what will happen if jugular foramen gets damaged come on so jugular foramen right let's look at this jugular foramen you can see this jugular foramen it is between the temporal bone and the occipital bone that means if i take out the individual bones and i ask you where is the jugular foramen you cannot see that it is seen only when the foramen are the bones are together in the skull right now you can see the jugular foramen now what all structure passes through jugular foramen let's look in this diagram what do you see over here so remember jugular foramen what passes through it the sigmoid sinus forms a jugular bulb and then it goes down and when it crosses it forms a internal jugular vein and before it forms internal jugular vein something else is going and crossing so i have told you a family story okay in the dural venous sinuses i have told you a family story so remember the inferior petrol sinus also goes in goes through this jugular foramen and it goes out of the cranial cavity joins the joins this sigmoid sinus and then together they become the internal jugular vein so two things i have told you one is the sigmoid sinus okay the second is the inferior petrosal sinus right what else passes through is 9 10th and 11th cranial nerves 9th is the glossopharyngeal nerve right 10th is the vagus nerve and 11th is the spinal accessory nerve right what else do we have we have some ms3 veins right okay and there is something which is very important coming up from below coming up from below okay so what is that what is that that is yes that is the meningeal branch of ascending pharyngeal artery and the meningeal branch of occipital artery correct so these are the contents of jugular foramen and now if you see these are damaged what can happen okay if the glossopharyngeal is damaged 9th is damaged 10th is damaged 11th is damaged jugular vein is damaged so what can happen okay so this was about the nerve loss of taste sensation on the anterior two third of tongue so anterior two third of tongue is supplied by cauda tympani cauda tympani is a branch of facial nerve will this be affected no loss of sensation on posterior one third of tongue loss posterior one third of tongue is supplied by ninth nerve right yes okay so that will be affected loss of sensory supply from anterior two third so that is supplied by lingual nerve temperature touch that is by fifth nerve so that will be affected no okay so this is being affected that we can see loss of taste sensation and sensory from anterior two third of tongue again no that we have seen so the correct answer to this question was b loss of sensation on posterior one third of tongue right okay 
clear. Let us go to the next question. So, this was a section, this is a coronal section of the jugular foramen. It is a little difficult to understand, but I can just show you over here that this is the jugular foramen. This is the temporal bone, this is the occipital bone. So, we have cut it like this, right. Okay, and this is the jugular foramen, jugular bulb, which is going down as the internal jugular vein. You can see the 9th, 10th and 11th nerve, they are going along with it downwards, right. Okay, let us go to the next question. Foreign body entry in laryngeal inlet is uh, pre prevented by cuff reflex. Now, reflex is sluggish in alcohol ingestion and some other conditions. Which nerve is likely injured or damaged? You see, very basic question. AIMS people have asked, INICT AIMS people, I say it AIMS people because AIMS examination cell makes the INICT paper. So, you see, they can have just asked which nerve is responsible for cuff reflex in the larynx, but they have made a clinical history and given to you. And this kind of clinical history are very easily able to decipher. So, answer we know which nerve is responsible, internal laryngeal nerve. The internal laryngeal nerve branch of superior laryngeal nerve. So, we know superior laryngeal nerve divides into internal laryngeal nerve and external laryngeal nerve. External laryngeal nerve remains outside, it supplies cricothyroid muscle, okay. Cricothyroid is the tensor of vocal folds and internal laryngeal nerve goes inside, it supplies supraglottis and it is responsible for cuff reflex, right. So, the answer to this question is internal laryngeal nerve. Now, I have, I have given you the superior laryngeal nerve so that there should not be any confusion if they change the choices. So, remember, so it is actually the superior laryngeal nerve, but it divides into internal. So, that is the most specific answer as given in the choices to us that is responsible for cuff reflex, right. Okay. Now, next question, if OA is absent, OAE, autoacoustic emission is absent, which other screening test can be done in neonates? So, if you are not able to do OE, OE is you know not available to you or it is absent. So, you know OE, when we do OE, now you should know this is interesting. OE gives two kinds of results, okay. It gives the result pass. So, now no need to do any further test, patient has passed. Now, if it is fail, the OE is absent, you do not say it as a fail, you say it is a refer. So, patient is referred for further testing and the testing is done by BERA. Okay. So, the answer to yes, Dr. Neha, that is correct, the answer is BERA. Tympanometry is done to find the conditions in the middle ear, but if this would have been given impedance audiometry, in impedance audiometry, we have stapedial reflex. Stapedial reflex is dependent upon the sound, it indicates whether the patient is hearing or not. So, that stapedial reflex is sometimes used for testing hearing as well. Audiometry, a neonate cannot respond to that, tuning fork test, again patient cannot respond to that. Remember, the test of hearing, they can be divided into subjective tests and they can be divided into objective tests, okay. Now, the subjective test, tuning fork test, they are subjective tests, right. Pure tone audiometry again is a subjective test, right. Okay. Now, the objective test includes your impedance audiometry, it includes your OAE, it includes your BERA, it includes your ECOG-G, that is your electrocochleography, okay. So, electro ECOG G electrocochleography. So, these are your objective tests. Now, we also have age dependent tests. We also have age, age dependent tests. So, these age dependent tests basically is for is not for objective tests, it is for subjective tests. Objective test you can do, you do not require the patient response. So, you can do any time whether the patient is awake, patient is sleeping, okay. But the subjective test you need patient cooperation. So, you can do these tests only when the patient is responding, right, okay. So, these tests 
are you know age dependent tests so age dependent tests like uh, we have behavioral response audiometry okay so be behavioral response audiometry okay then we have visual reinforcement audiometry okay we have play audiometry and then we have pure tone audiometry so these are age dependent these are age dependent audiometry test so you know behavioral response audiometry so what we can do in this you know sometimes you clap the uh, cl clap or sometimes you beat a thali with a stick and you can see the child moving the head the child gets startled okay so this kind of audiometry you can do from 0 to 6 months child now visual reinforcement orientation audiometry we can also call it as vroa okay so now like this now this is done from 6 months to 3 years here you some use some visual cues to reinforce the response from the child play audiometry is done from 3 years to 9 years you involve the child in some kind of play and then after 9 years you can simply ask for responses so this is age dependent audiometry right so this is also sometime asked in the exam now another question which was asked if o is absent in a patient so you know this question can be asked in this way as well if o is absent in a patient the next step is now the next step you know in this bera is not mentioned you see over here the bera is not mentioned so the answer the correct answer should have been bera because i got this question in two different formats some students said the two different question came in the exam now if bera is not given in the option what will you mark pure tone audiometry speech audiometry and free field audiometry okay now all these three tympanometry i said is going to check for middle ear conditions if stapedial reflex was given then i would have said that okay you are testing for hearing so that means if stapedial reflex was given that means impedance audiometry was given so if you are talking about a neonate if you are talking about a neonate and yes no no dr mathu just understand no dr sona just try to understand what i am telling you over here now there is a trick to this question what i am trying to tell you is speech audiometry and pure tone audiometry you cannot do in children remember i just showed you pure tone audiometry and speech audiometry pure tone audiometry gives you tones speech audiometry gives you words both of them can be done above 9 years only right okay so both of them are not possible if the question was about a neonate of course we use this for neonate screening so if the question was about a neonate you cannot do pure tone audiometry or speech audiometry now tympanometry is not checking for hearing okay impedance audiometry checks for hearing got it pure tympanometry is a objective test but it does not check for hearing if you include it with stapedial reflex then it checks for hearing so if i mention over here impedance audiometry i will choose that option but that is not there so what is there free field audiometry yes what is free field audiometry free field audiometry means behavioral response audiometry okay it is behavioral response audiometry so you give sound from here or you give sound from here and you clap like this or you clap like this and the child is startled the child looks over here the child looks over here okay that's a free field audiometry you're giving sound from anywhere and the child is turning the head in that direction so before oe was discovered and you know even the parents they will like to clap and they will see the child is 
turning the head or not or they will use some kind of toys that make noises and make the child turn the head they'll try to engage the child so free field audiometry is something like an age old practice that we used to do for finding the hearing of a child when the child was born okay within first few weeks or first few months so that is the answer okay free field audiometry is the answer that same as behavioral response audiometry got it okay so this was a trick question i know many students marked it as tympanometry when this question came but that is why they have not mentioned impedance over here so i have to tell you that free field audiometry is the answer in this question okay so let's come to the inict june 2022 exam right let's go over here i'm i'm looking for your responses good to know that you are following me let's continue the session okay now the image below shows a ct scan of a patient with laryngeal cancer what is the staging okay so if you remember the laryngeal staging and this question when it came i gave my students you know we we remember the laryngeal staging is done by vocal fold mobility you don't see mobility in ct scan do you no okay t1 fully mobile one fold or both the folds one fold is t1a both the fold is t1b fully mobile t2 is restricted mobility impaired mobility that means incomplete mobility t3 is one of the fold is fixed not mobile so till t1 t2 t3 you have to check the mobility you cannot tell it by ct scan when can you tell it by a ct scan or by an mri yes when can you tell it tell that only when it is going outside the larynx in t4 right so if a ct scan or mri picture is given to you in laryngeal cancer see it's not even about the image it's about a basic common sense okay so if 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 this is this is going to be there then the answer is t4 if the ct scan or an mri image is given to you the answer you know they are asking staging from you they will definitely give us t4 right okay all right so answer you see over here now this is a ct scan how do i say it's a ct scan you can see over here that the vertebra is visible to you you can see the cartilage is also visible to you over here and there is a invasion of the cartilage the arrow is shown over here you can see this mass growing and it is invading the cartilage cartilage erosion is there complete erosion of thyroid cartilage can be seen in this place over here so this is a t4 lesion okay right t4 a is the best answer over here king raj doctor ent notes milenge that the allen people will tell you beta how when you will get the notes but i believe that students you must make your own notes if you are you know you can't you can't win a race with crutches okay sprinted notes are crutches people who win the race are the people who make their own notes when you write when you draw when you then you understand then you understand then you remember okay you are able to revise it better your your own handwritten notes are the best nothing can compete that okay so to all my students i always advise one thing watch the videos you're attending a live class watch the listen to the lecture make your own notes okay don't be dependent upon the printed notes okay anyways my notes are available in so many forms in uh, pdf and all those places everywhere so you have the notes all right i think my notes are one of the easiest available notes in the market all right so given alongside is an image of tympanic membrane with retraction pocket right what is the grade of the retraction pocket now this question look at the tympanic membrane so i have taught all the gradings all the retraction pocket gradings in my lecture now let's look at the tympanic membrane what do you see over here where is the retraction the retraction you see is in the pars tensa okay a retraction can be there in pars tensa it can be there in pars flaccida both of them lead to formation of aticoantral disease 
Now over here we are talking about pars tensor grading. Right? Okay. So pars tensor retraction bucket grading, you can see this is the malleus. This is the handle of malleus. And as you can see that the handle of malleus is foreshortened. It looks shortened to me. Right? Isn't it? This is foreshortened. Right? Okay. What else do you see? You can see over here that there is something wrong. Okay. What is this? This is your stapes. This is the stapes head. Head is visible. The incus should have been coming over here, but the incus is missing. Right? The incus is missing over here. I can't see the lenticular process of incus clearly, but I am clearly able to see the stapes head. Right? I also see that at some places it is reaching the the promontory. Okay? So, it is reaching the promontory, but it does not look to me adherent to the promontory. Right? Okay? I does not doesn't look that it is touching the promontory also. Right? Now, let us look at the grading. Let us look at the different gradings, then we will come to the answer to this question. Right? Okay. So, let us just first start with the pars flaccida grading, the attic retraction pocket grading, because that is something which is usually asked in your exam. All right. So, that is a normal tympanic membrane, it is a normal pars flaccida over here. And if it slightly goes in without touching the neck of malleus, that is a grade 1 retraction. It is a mild retraction. Grade 2 is when it touches the handle of malleus. Grade 3 is when it starts eroding the scutum over here. So, the scutum erosion starts and the pocket that is formed, you are able to see all the walls of the pocket. So, you, we say it is a minor erosion of scutum and all the walls of the retraction pocket are visible to you. right? And grade 4 is when this is major erosion. Okay, when this is major erosion and retraction pocket, all the walls are not visible to you. That is a grade 4. Some people say grade 5 as well, when the obvious clostoma is visible over here. So, they call it as a grade 5 retraction. Right? Now, look some of the examples you see over here, that is a grade 2 retraction. So, grade 2 you can see that the neck of malleus is nicely visible over here. Okay? So, that is a pars flaccida retraction, grade 2 neck of malleus is visible over here. Now, this is a grade 4 retraction. You can see that there is a big erosion of the scutum and you can see that all the walls are not visible to you. You can see this retraction pocket, this epithelium going. In fact, you know, you can see the colostoma flakes. So, some people call it as a grade 5 retraction when the obvious colostoma flakes are visible over here. This is another, you know, the attic, the debris, the colostoma is visible there is a major erosion, it is a grade 4 retraction and in both of them you can see the pars tensor is normal. Right? Okay. Next, we look at the pars tensor retraction pocket. Pars tensor retraction pocket was given by Sade. So, Sade's retraction pocket grading, grade 1 retraction pocket. Now, grade 1 retraction, not a pocket, grade 1 retraction is when the handle of malleus is foreshortened. Right? The cone of light, this is distorted. Right? What else do we have over here? What else do we have over here? You can see that the anterior and the posterior malleolar folds, they become more prominent. So, that is known as a grade 1 retraction. Now, grade 2 retraction, you can see over here, it starts getting adherent to the IS joint, incudostepedial joint. Right? Okay? Now, grade 3 is when, now you see this is adherent to promontory. So, adherent to promontory word, other, other I should say that it is touching the promontory. Okay, you can see that the step is incus, like look carefully, the incus is there, but it is, it is going till here, but it is not covering completely like this. So, that means some part of incus is eroded over here. Okay, some, when we operate, we see generally this, this part, this is a, this is a fibrous band that is left the bone is generally gone. But you can see it is reaching the promontory. Now, if you do a sigilization, you will see that this tympanic membrane is mobile. So, it is not adherent. It is touching the promontory, but it is not adherent. And grade 4 retraction, you can see over here, it is completely adherent to promontory. So, grade 3 and grade 4, you can 
differentiate only on siglization right now in our question we could not see the pars tensor like this so it was not touching the promontory fully so i'll call it as a grade 2 retraction pocket grade 2 retraction okay now this is sometimes an isolated posterior superior retraction pocket as well okay so sometimes this is also formed the entire pars tensor is not retracted only the posterior superior part is retracted to form a pocket right so our question the answer was type 2 grade 2 okay let's look at another question a patient presented to emergency with acute vertigo with horizontal nystagmus slow component is towards the left side what is more likely the diagnosis come on guys very interesting question i want you to try answering this question if you haven't done it earlier please try to answer this question okay first thing first thing the first hint given in this question to you all was that in this question patient had horizontal nystagmus okay now we know that in case of bppv bppv most commonly involved canal is posterior and in posterior we have vertical nystagmus a geotropic nystagmus with a slight with a slight yes good good with a slight torsional component okay so horizontal nystagmus the posterior canal bppv is ruled out okay that is not possible right okay now superior canal bppv superior canal bppv again will have torsional component there will be lot of torsional component in it and some vertical component so this is ruled out so two options are ruled out even if you don't know about hypoactive or hyperactive labyrinth you can just see that the it cannot be bppv because it is horizontal nystagmus it has to be either of these two right okay now this is hypoactive dr sanjay this is hypoactive it is not hyper this is also hypoactive so it can be either left hypoactive or it can be right hypoactive now this question was based upon vor okay vestibulo ocular reflex vor and the aims people they are fond of asking question of vor they have asked two or three questions based upon vor the gaze stabilizing reflex you know your vestibular system it stabilizes your eyes you are able to focus on them and as you can see over here that if you are stimulating the right labyrinth okay what is it doing what is it doing it is going and stimulating you see you see over here it is going and stimulating the left lateral rectus and right medial rectus and at the same time what is being inhibited what is being inhibited over here is the left medial rectus and the right lateral rectus right okay so so what will happen what will happen over here come on guys where is the nystagmus going the nystagmus now the slow component look over here the question was a little tricky why why the slow component is towards the left side okay the slow component is towards the left side all right now just remember if the slow component we don't look at the slow component we always look at the fast component the, the nystagmus is defined by the fast component that means this nystagmus is actually okay the nystagmus is actually towards right side yes it is actually towards the right side of the patient okay now i'll give you a hint i'll give you a hint you don't have to remember the vor you just don't have to remember the vor this is a very simple and easy trick forget about all this we have to choose between the two options whether it is c or d okay and i'll give you a hint now you know that the nystagmus is towards the right side okay remember syringing 
let me make this question easy to you remember syringing now syringing we do with cold water and we do it with hot water and the mnemonic was cows cold opposite warm same side cold opposite warm same side okay so if we are giving a cold stimulus if you are giving a cold stimulus so what happens you make everything slow you make everything slow you make everything hypoactive okay if you give something hot what happens you are making fast you are making it hyperactive okay right so you are giving it slow you are giving it cold that you are making it hypoactive you are giving it hot you are making it hyperactive just remember by syringing everything in this question will become very easy now cold now if i say if i say the nystagmus is going towards my right side nystagmus is going towards my right side and you are doing syringing you are doing syringing so what could have you done cold opposite cold opposite that means either you would have done a cold stimulation in the left ear or you would have done a warm stimulation in the right ear right okay you would have done a warm stimulation in the right ear. that is why it is going towards my right or you would have done a cold stimulation in the left ear right that is why it is going towards my right clear so now you have the answer you have the answer so that means you have you have either made the right side warm simulation means we have made it hyperactive or you have made the left one as hypoactive that is why the nystagmus is going towards the towards the right side it is given slow component is towards left so nystagmus is actually going towards right side so that was the trick in this question if you know that if you know syringing your answer is solved answer is left hypoactive right so just remember the syringing if you remember the syringing this question becomes so easy you don't have to remember the vor you don't have to remember which is being stimulated which is being inhibited okay but it is good to know that it is stimulating the other side left lateral rectus and right medial rectus so anyways we'll not go into that details let's go to the next question i've given a very good trick to solve it you all know about syringing and the mnemonic cows okay arrange an order from cochlear nerve to the hearing pathway so this is a repeat question we saw it the mnemonic was e colima this was the first question i dealt it has come four times in last three years yes yes neha you are correct it is left hypoactive that's the guy that was the answer over here okay so you know we know this answer a is cochlear nucleus cochlear nucleus you put over here superior olivary complex b okay and then medial geniculate body c and inferior colliculus d sorry inferior colliculus d a b d c that's the answer over here you can simply solve it by e coli ma right okay let's look at another question that was asked a 7 years old boy presents with poor growth okay 7 years old boy presents with poor growth high arch palate impaired hearing with history of recurrent urti what is this this you know indicating high arch palate where have you read it adenoid facies adenoid facies okay this is a classical presentation even at the adenoids hypertrophic between the age of 5 to 7 years classical presentation poor growth the child does not have poor has proper growth because the child is having obstructive sleep apnea right tympanogram is shown below it shows a b type curve so b type curve you can see or a flat curve b type curve this is seen in cirrostitis media glue ear so patient is having blue ear as well what would be the most appropriate management so you know this condition may look like tympanometry is given to you it may look like a ear condition but actually it is a case of adenoid hypertrophy okay a wonderful thing i like to share you know in my time 
we used to have all india pg we used to have delhi pg exam i did my mbbs from ucms delhi and i was appearing for my delhi pg exam and this same question came in my delhi pg exam right so this question i love this question because i solved it at that time and uh, you know before uh, my batch usually the delhi pg paper used to be one liner paper but in our paper we got a lot of clinical questions and that was a total different paper from the other and uh, i i feel i was lucky that i got a lot of clinical questions unlike many other students because i was able to crack that exam because of the high number of clinical questions so this question came in my delhi pg question and paper as well many many years back right so what would be the most appropriate management for the above case so you know that's adenoid hypertrophy unless you do adenoidectomy this patient problem will not solve okay and the only option where i can see adenoidectomy mentioned over here is b right and of course there is a glue here you have to do a grommet insertion that is the answer for grommet insertion obviously you will do meringotomy so that is something which is understood over here right okay so let's solve the inict november 2021 paper as well shall we yes okay so uh, let's solve this paper as well uh, i think november 2021 and we'll do that do the june 2021 paper as well that will be more than enough okay so identify the anatomical variant shown in the given image so what can you see over here you can see over here that a ct scan is given to you i have taught you these cells now what do you see over here you can see this is the septum you can see this septum going over here and you can see a cell coming from here from the skull base over here like this <coughs> okay now what is this cell now remember from the from the skull base rises the middle turbinate now the middle turbinate over here is nematized and the when the middle turbinate is nematized we call it as concha bullosa so this is a nematized middle turbinate and so this is known as concha bullosa so this is a very typical finding it is sometime pushing the septum to the other side leading to deviated nasal septum and obstruction of the other side so you just don't have to do septoplasty you have to also remove this concha bullosa so that the septum comes back to into its place because otherwise if you don't do that septum will never come back to its place right it is not a nematized superior turbinate why it is not a nematized superior turbinate because it is lying very anteriorly okay you are able to see the maxillary sinus you are able to see that this is probably the ansnet process over here so it is very very anterior the superior turbinate lies very posterior okay right and superior turbinate does not arises like this from the skull it arises from the ethmoid but does not arises like this it has to go a little bit more posterior to called as a superior turbinate nematization right okay let's go to the next question over here okay so this is another example of a middle turbinate being nematized that's a concha bullosa over here uh sorry i think i'll have to go over here yes uh, tamanna you are right over here i'm sorry i missed this finding over here this is the middle turbinate and this probably is the superior turbinate over here yes you are right over here i'm sorry i missed it this is the middle turbinate which i can see over here now this is the middle turbinate that's the inferior turbinate and this is the superior turbinate okay right so this is a nematized superior turbinate over here guys you can see the concha bullosa that's the concha bullosa over here right yes so this is the concha bullosa over here yes and sometimes the onodi cells are asked to you now the easiest way to identify the onodi cells the optic nerve lies over here in them but you know you can be confused between an onodi cell and a superior Uh, sphenoid sinus so once you look at the posterior quena that's the posterior quena where you can see this posterior quena this is almost at the end the septum is ending you are at the nasopharynx at this level if you see a horizontal demarcation over here okay so that is the onodi cell so this has to be the onodi cell if you see a horizontal 
demarcation over here. So, this has to be the onodic cell. So, on this side you can see the sphenoid sinus, on this side you can see the sphenoid sinus and this is the onodic cell over here, right. Okay. And in this you can see bilateral onodic cell over here. Right. So, this is the sphenoid sinus, you can see the lateral extension of the sphenoid sinus as well and this is the onodic cell over here in this cut, right. Okay. And this of course, this is the Heller cell, I have discussed this in my videos as well. Okay. So, these are the Heller cells, you can see that this is the unsnet process. As I was saying, the middle turbinate arises from the skull base. So, middle turbinate actually has three origins anterior most region is at the skull base okay then the middle is from the medial wall of the orbit okay from the lamina preparatia the third one goes posteriorly like this okay so there are three three origins middle terminates or three attachments of the middle turbinate you can see anterior attachment is to the skull base over here right so that is the heller cell over here right Next question, a 75 year old lady presented in ENT clinic with one year history of progressive nasal obstruction. Okay. So, let us mark it, 75 year old lady in ENT clinic with one year history of progressive nasal obstruction along with mucoid discharge, right, which is occasionally blood stained. A mass was seen on endoscopic examination as shown below in the image. CT or MRI, query MRI, what was done was shown below. So, uh, this finding, I think I do not have the MRI image over here. Shall Do we have the MRI image? Yes, we have. This is the CT scan image or the MRI, I do not know which was given in the exam. So, I have kept both of them in the exam as was given to be my students, right. So, let us break down this question and try to understand what was being asked? There is a 75 year elderly lady with a one year history of progressive nasal obstruction with mucoid discharge, which is occasionally blood stained. Okay, right? Mass was seen on endoscopic examination as shown below. So, this was the mass that was seen over here, right? Question is what is most like diagnosis squamous cell carcinoma of maxillary sinus jna of course is ruled out why it is ruled out the why the jna is ruled out because it is seen in teen teen age group males okay it is not a disease of the females so female ruled out jna that is not possible okay esthesioneuroblastoma inverted papilloma and squamous cell carcinoma so all three possibilities are there now, esthesioneuroblastoma, it rises from the cribriform plate. Inverted papilloma is generally seen at the age of 50 to 60 years, more common in females, okay, uh, more common in. But then you have to see 75, all three are present. Inverted papilloma does not present with occasional blood stain, it will present with bleeding, right. Now, Okay, now this picture was given to you. This picture is typical picture of inverted papilloma. This picture or this picture, one of this was given to you, and this is a typical where you have infolding granulomas on biopsy. Okay, let us look at this picture. Now, this picture, this picture over here, what do you see in this picture? You see that the cribriform plate is free. So, esthesio neuroblastoma is ruled out. Now, the choice that is left between you for you is squamous cell carcinoma and inverted papilloma. Okay. The clinical photograph was in favor of inverted papilloma, although it is seen in 50 to 60 year age group, but 75 also it can present. It is a benign tumor. Now, what else do you see in this photograph? There is a erosion. You see over here, there is a erosion of the bony wall. But if you look carefully, you will see that this erosion is because of presence of such a big mass. There is no infiltration. Okay. You see, unlike a squamous cell carcinoma, it will not form a big mass and then erode the bone. It will be small and then it will erode the bone like this and it will go into the orbit. 
okay here despite the erosion you can see a clear demarcation between the tumor mass and the orbital contents okay it has not gone into the orbital contents so the diagnosis the clinical picture all right let's look at the mri finding as well in the mri finding you can see a clear demarcation over here right okay the bone resorption is there so this is a clearly showing that this is a case of inverted papilloma it's a benign tumor it's not a malignancy right okay so the answer is answer is answer is no the bone resorption can be seen in benign tumors also dr tamanna it can be seen in benign tumors as well as malignant tumors malignancy it is because of infiltration and destruction benign tumors it because of pressure necrosis and resorption okay so because over here the clinical picture you see the clinical picture is a papillomatous picture right plus over here there is no invasion of the tissues okay there is no invasion of the tissues over here the resorption of the bone is seen okay but there is no infiltration so that goes in favor of this being a benign tumor of course the definitive diagnosis is done by biopsy histopathological examination also remember 10% cases of inverted papilloma have hidden squamous cell carcinoma inside them okay so that is also there but for our answer this question uh, answer has to be you know i i have written over here maxillary cell carcinoma but i say it is a inverted papilloma going by the clinical picture right okay let's go over here now this 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 picture i have kept to you to show to you that you see over here the first one is a case of inverted papilloma you can see that this tumor is filling the entire space but focus on this wall it is pushing the wall okay it is pushing the wall right you can still say still see that some part of the wall is there look over here in case of maxillary sinus carcinoma you see that there is air over here there is a infiltrative lesion look at the wall only this much wall is there the wall is destroyed right so you can compare these two you can compare these two and this gives you a hint you can see over here that there is air in the maxillary sinus carcinoma whereas this is completely filling over here okay so the answer to our question was inverted papilloma right okay look over here this is a destruction this is a destruction over here right so this is difference between inverted papilloma and maxillary sinus carcinoma of course the definitive diagnosis is made by biopsy and this over here you can see the esthesio neuroblastoma it is coming from the cribriform plate so it is coming from above right and it can also go up into the cranial cavity like this that is visible over here right so this is another diagrams of esthesio neuroblastoma the ct scan and you can see that this is destroyed this is infiltrated over here this is again you can see the infiltration and you can see the destruction of the cribriform plate right okay now a child presented with bilateral eac atresia which of the following is the best to be used so four choices were given to you identify the devices what were these devices the first one is a baha okay second one is a cochlear implant third one you can see over here this is a torp and the fourth is a stapes piston right so which one will you use for bilateral eac atresia we know the answer is baha right that is the answer that's a bone anchor this is a bone anchored hearing aid okay so it is applied over here with the help of a titanium screw and it gives the sound directly yes vikas tamanna dr k k you are right the answer is baha okay indications of baha we know bilateral conductive hearing loss that can be because of eac atresia or a chronic discharge which we are not able to correct by surgery that can be chronic otitis media or externa or because of hearing aid there is uncontrollable feedback a patient using a conventional bone conduction hearing aids can also use it only hearing aid you don't want to operate in otosclerosis tympanosclerosis or canal atresia one side but the only hearing aid you don't want to want to operate it single sided deafness you know 
with the bone conduction the battery here is less than 45 decibels you can use it in place of cross hearing aid as well okay this is a cochlear implant we just saw in the photograph cochlear implant indications bilateral severe to profound sensory neural hearing loss eac atresia will have conductive hearing loss remember that okay so adults 70 decibels and children 90 decibels i'm just revising these for you because these criteria they are asked in the inict exam and the poor speech perception sds score speech discrimination score less than 20 to 30 percent then patients are given hearing aids for at least six months okay no improvement with hearing aids for six months and the age is one year or older less than one year us fda does not allow cochlear implantation other than for research purposes okay abis this is a abi now this has a flat okay now remember over here this this electrode is a flat electrode to be placed upon the cochlear nucleus spiral ganglion okay so that's a abi indication of abi is where you can't do cochlear implantation where bilateral total ossified cochlea bilateral vestibular schwannoma cochlea cochlear nerve is absent okay bilateral inner ear malformations like michel's aplasia or uh, 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 cochleosacular dysplasia right now this is torp what do we do with torp type 3c tympanoplasty okay and this is a porp we do a type 3b tympanoplasty over here this is a laser stapedotomy we use stapes piston like this and attach it from incus to stapes we make a hole in the stapes stapedotomy and we put over there right now which of the following is not used in post total laryngectomy rehabilitation polite yawning super supraglottic swallowing esophageal speech tracheoesophageal speech now, this was also a common sense question why 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 i am saying common sense question if we have done total laryngectomy if you have done total laryngectomy now what happens in total laryngectomy you have removed the larynx so you have removed the larynx you have removed the supraglottis so if we remove the supraglottis there cannot be super supraglottic swallowing this cannot this is not possible okay so if we have removed the larynx there is no supraglottis there cannot be super supraglottic swallowing so that was a common sense question okay of course for rehabilitation we do esophageal speech we give tracheoesophageal speech what is this polite yawning okay let's look at this polite yawning voice rehabilitation and olfactory rehabilitation we have to do these two things for a post laryngectomy patient we have to also give pulmonary rehabilitation and swallowing rehabilitation okay now electrolarynx is the easiest way to do a voice rehabilitation where the patient puts it below the floor of the mouth okay this is electrolarynx it produces sound which goes and patient can convert into speech not a very good way because the voice is not good the speech is not good but it is very easy to use esophageal speech patient takes air in the esophagus pushes it back with a lot of pressure right tracheoesophageal speech there is a there is a tracheoesophageal voice processes we call it as tep okay so known as tep this is placed between the trachea and esophagus right and this produces the sound this is the best way to rehabilitate for voice now this is was about voice rehabilitation olfactory rehabilitation patient is not able to smell because patient is breathing from air so patient is asked to do polite yawning take some air in the mouth and bring it out through the nose this helps in circulation of air in the mouth and nasal cavity and helps in and helps in olfactory rehabilitation pulmonary rehabilitation you want the ventilation humidification so you can put these kind of walls on the tracheostome they help in humidification filtration as well as you know they can give a hands free speaking wall they allow the air only to go in the air coming out comes out through tep so this is done in patients who have undergone a tep procedure as well For swelling rehabilitation is done in in post laryngectomy because the pump action of the larynx is gone so patient are also taught the swallowing rehabilitation 
Now, here the trick was super supraglottic swelling. So, supraglottis has to be present. Now, this kind of swelling is taught to people who have a normal larynx, who have problem in swelling. Okay. So, I will not go into that details because they are not in there. The patient is asked to improve the swelling and how does the patient improve the swelling? By taking some amount of water in the mouth, keeping it for some time and then swallowing it. Okay, right. So, that is a super supraglottic swelling. So, you need supraglottis for that. So, that is not done post tarinjectomy. Alright. Next question. Two year, a girl, sorry, a girl underwent mastodectomy for CSM in right ear. Two months post surgery, she presented with complaints of fluctuating hearing loss, vertigo, tinnitus and ear fullness. Finding dis disappears on keeping the right ear up. Right ear up means like this. So, right ear surgery is done. Okay, the patient keeps the right ear up like this. The condition disappear. The moment the patient becomes erect or keeps the right ear down, these conditions they come. So, what is coming? What, what is the patient experiencing? Fluctuating hearing loss. What I go? Tinnitus and ear fullness. Finding disappears. Now, these kind of findings, this is somewhat similar to Meniere's disease, but Meniere's disease is not dependent upon the head position. Okay. This is the Meniere's is not dependent upon the head position. Right. Now, finding disappear on keeping the right ear up. What is the most likely diagnosis? All these are indicative of inner ear pathology. Now, let us look over here. Vestibular schwannoma, 8th nerve tumor, not possible. Labyrinthitis, infection of the inner ear. Will it disappear by keeping the right ear up? No. Plus, the patient should have fever, okay, which is missing over here. That is not being seen. Okay. Paget disease, again a chronic disease, that is also not possible. Now, the only condition that is left for you is perilymphatic fistula. So, while doing the surgery, you have created a perilymphatic fistula, generally that is created near the stapes or on the, on the oval window and the perilymph is coming out okay? and it may be also be coming out sometimes from round window also. Okay, and let us look over here. Is this a video? No, this is not a video. This is a photograph only and you can see a small perilymph fistula over here and because of that, whenever the patient keeps the ear down, the perilymph starts coming out and because of that, patient has vertigo, antinitis and ear fullness. Okay. So, this is another photograph of perilymph fistula. This is a photograph where the lateral semicircular canal fistula is there and from here, the fistula is coming. So, we can, you know, categorize this fistula based linked to trauma. That is a category 1. Middle ear surgery, that is iatrogenic trauma. Okay. Category 2 is barotrauma. Right. And category 3 is some other, you know, th that is not linked to any of these conditions. Internal straining, sneezing or coughing. With, with that only you have developed the perilymphatic fistula. And number category 4 is that no such event the patient can describe to you. Right. Barotrauma, there is a history of barotrauma. Remember in barotrauma important is just remember coming back, coming back to the ground. Patient has barotrauma. That means if you are in a flight, when you come down and when you have gone for sea diving, when you are coming back, coming up. Okay. So, rapid descent in a flight and rapid ascent in sea diving. So, just remember coming back to ground. Okay. You have trauma. Right. Okay. So, what is a definitive perilymphatic fistula? Four things have to be there. Fluctuating or maybe a non-fluctuating hearing loss. If it is a big fistula, it will, it will always be there. Tinnitus, oral fullness. Okay. And there may be some trauma like over here, there was a history of ear surgery, middle ear surgery or there is a barotrauma. Okay. Right. Now, you do not have to do much about it, but this is more than enough. Okay. Let us do the last paper. This is the last paper that we will discuss. INICT July 2021 paper. All of the following are major criteria for diagnosis of allergic fungal sinusitis except. So, we know which criteria is used. Yes, bent 
and Kuhn diagnostic criteria. You see, I am discussing almost five, six papers. That's more than enough for you. Okay. So, we are discussing the, we have discussed the May 2023, the 2022, both the papers and 21, five papers we have discussed, previous year papers. I, ideally, you should do two to three years. That's the bare minimum that you must be doing. Okay. If you have more time, you can do five years. That means for INICD, that, that will amount to around 10 papers that you have to do. Okay, so that is the minimum and this will tell you the trends, this will tell you the high yield topics. Don't think the same questions will come. That's why I am trying to discuss around the questions as well, the different topics as well with you. Okay, now, yes, Dr. Sanjay, you have given the right answer, Bent and Kuhn, positive fungal culture. Culture is a minor criteria, major criteria is staining. Okay, Bent and Kuhn, that's the important. And remember, it has five major criteria. All five major have to be present to called as AFRS. Right? That means 100% patients of AFRS will have nasal polyposis. Type 1 hypersensitivity is also there. Right? Characteristic CT scan finding, double dense appearance, allergic mucin discharge without invasion. Right? So, these are the five criteria that have to be there. Right? So, what are five criteria? One, two, three, staining. Staining is the major criteria, not the culture. Four and five. Right? Okay? So, answer was positive fungal culture. So, these are the criteria that I have mentioned over here. Type 1 hypersensitivity, nasal polyposis, characteristic CT scan findings, eosinophilic mucin without invasion and positive fungal stain. Okay? Now, asthma, unilateral disease, bone erosion, bone erosion again in AFRS also I was just like I was showing you in inverted papilloma, in AFRS also there can be bone erosion but it is because of you know pressure necrosis. Right? It is not because of invasion. Right? Fungal culture is a minor criteria, charcoal laden crystals can be seen and serum eosinophilia. These are all minor criteria. Okay? Now, all of the following, so answer was positive fungal culture over here. Now, identify the structure with the arrow in the given, in the image given below. So, what you can see over here, you can see that this is a bird beak appearance over here and bilateral bird beak appearance is being seen over here. So, this is the place where the anterior model artery, it comes and crosses and if surgeon sees this preoperatively, he has to be very careful because the anterior ethmoidal artery is hanging in the in the mesentery over here, just like in the mesentery, it's hanging in the mucosa over here. So, this is anterior ethmoidal canal over here, that's the answer. So, this is a bird beak appearance. All right, you can see over here, that's the answer to this question. All right, so we've seen this, let's, this is the uh, anterior ethmoidal and the posterior ethmoidal artery that we can see. This is the cadaveric dissection photograph and you can see over here, this is the anterior ethmoidal artery, this is the posterior ethmoidal artery, right? Okay, let's, let's discuss the next question over here, again very interesting question. Identify the deformity in the pig below. Come on guys, should be a spot diagnosis for you. What do you see over here? Overlapping of teeth, anterior teeth. Okay, overlapping of anterior teeth. Yes, adenoid facies. Okay, this is adenoid facies, frog face deformity. This is seen in angiofibroma, JNA. Telecanthus plus proptosis. Okay, frog face deformity. This is a typical adenoid facies over here. Right? Okay, typical adenoid facies. Very good photograph given for the anterior overlapping, overcrowding of anterior teeth. Right? Okay, high arch palate. This is the frog face deformity. Telecanthus. Telecanthus plus proptosis. Okay, seen in. JNA which is going into the orbital cavity. Okay? So, this is a golden heart syndrome where you have oculo, auriculo, vertebral spectrum. Okay? So, lot of things are over there. So, you can see this is the golden heart syndrome. Right? 
and so answer to this question was adenoid phases. I do not know what is frog phase deformity, I think pediatricians might be able to shed. So, I do not know what that is or maybe it was given as a fox option to you. Okay. Covid virus enters brain through, yes. So, I think this was in the covid era 2021 when we had the delta the most severe uh, wave, wave of the covid virus over here in India and the covid virus enters brain through, we know it is enters to the crib reform plate that is the danger area of nose. Remember, this is the danger area of face, the danger triangle, the cribriform plate that is the danger area of nose. From there, the infection can directly go and enter into the brain. So, the virus is in the nose, it can enter to the, to the cribriform plate, olfactory area, right? All right. Okay. So, that A mentioned was the cribriform plate. This is the optic canal. We can see the foramen rotundum, foramen ovale, and foramen spinosum commonly you know remembered as ROS. Okay, this is visible from the intracranial side. You can also see the jugular foramen over here. Okay, that is the foramen lastrum. Again foramen lastrum is between the temporal bone and sphenoid bone. Okay, it is not present in any bone, it is present between the two bones. Right? Okay, that is the foramen lastrum. So, the answer to this question was A. Right? Choose procedure done in the given image. This also was repeated later. So, we have discussed this. Okay, this is a nasociliary block. We have discussed the different blocks. All right, we have discussed the trigeminal pathway also. Right. Okay. So, this question was asked a six year old male patient with recurrent swelling in the marked area in the image underwent surgery. Okay. Next day morning, the patient has. So, you see what area is marked over here? this area is marked over here. So, what do we have in this area? We have tonsils. We have tonsils. Next day morning patient has mild bleeding from oral cavity. Okay, sur surgeon expects bleeder to be from. Come on. Come on. Okay, now you see the bleeding is next day morning. The bleeding is next day morning. Recurrent swelling, tonsillitis patient, tonsillectomy surgery has been done. So, this is reactionary bleeding. Okay, this is reactionary bleeding. Right? It is a mild bleeding, but it is a reactionary bleeding within 24 hours. Okay, now which area bleeding it should be? Come on. Come on, we know, we know hemorrhage bleeding. Yes. The bleeding, you know the primary bleeding, primary intraoperative bleeding is from paratonsillar vein. Okay, it is from paratonsillar vein and why it is there? Because you have damaged the vein, right? Now, the reactionary bleeding is also from the paratonsillar vein, slippage of the ligature, slippage of the ligature, right? Okay, so reactionary bleeding, answer to this question is paratonsillar vein. Okay, right, that is the reactionary bleeding slippage of ligature. Right, okay. So, complications, let us look at the complication. Most common complication is hemorrhage, primary intraoperative, most common source is paratonsillar vein. You apply a suture to it, reactionary bleeding within 24 hours, slippage of suture, slippage of ligature. Okay, treatment is take the patient back to the OT, repeat ligation. Right and secondary is 5 to 7 days. Now, this is because of secondary infection and the treatment is by IV antibiotics. Right. So, the answer to this question was paratonsillar vein. So, friends, in the limited tribe, I have discussed, try to discuss as many topics, not just the question, as many topics as possible which are asked in the exam, which have been actually asked in the INICT exam. I hope. I wish you all best of luck. I hope you will utilize the knowledge that I have tried to share over here, right? If you have any doubts, feel free to write to me, okay? You can write to me. You can just WhatsApp me. I will give you the number. You can just feel free to write to me, 962542016. 
Okay, so that's my direct WhatsApp number. You can just WhatsApp me, and whenever I am free from the surgeries or from the lectures, I'll be happy to solve your doubts. Best of luck, everyone. Right? Thank you. Best wishes.